Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got massive harem with gods. Huge shout out to book lover reader for this story. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Naruto's body was floating in endless darkness. Suddenly two figures a male and a female approached him and held up his unconscious body in the bridal style. You have completed your work here. It is time I take you to your second home, my great-grandson. The male figure said to Naruto. It is time to give your great-grandson and my grandson some gifts that will help him in the other world. I too will give him something a voice said from the darkness. They quickly turned and saw another beautiful woman. It was Kami. When she got to Naruto's sleeping body she spoke my gift will make sure he will never be alone death will never take away his loved ones from him again. With that she bent over and kissed Naruto full on the lips. Naruto's body glowed pure white, and then the glow faded. The blonde had just woken to realize was now in a bed. From the sounds outside the window, it seemed that it was very noisy out there. Slowly waking up, Naruto bolted up and looked around, this place was not his apartment in the village hidden in the leaves, nor was it a hospital room. He also realized that he had shrunken. Looking around he noticed a scroll addressed to him. Dear Naruto. We are sorry we won't be there when up wake up. First we are your grandmother and great-grandfather. I'm sorry I could not be there for you growing up. There are laws our families have that forces any children of theirs or their descendants to be raised by someone we trust or love. I know it must be strange to you, but I hope you understand. I fully intend to have you brought up by your father and mother, but that fox sealed and you stopped that. Their deaths hurt us and not being able to take care of you even more. Please believe us we would want nothing more than to raise you, but the laws are stopping us. You are now in another world far from your own. This is the world of your great-grandfather, and we brought you her after we found you at the valley. Don't worry though, we will meet in time. When the time comes, we both will be happy to see you. Now, since you are still young, you have to go to school in this world, and we have enrolled you in Yancey Academy, except you will have your age reduced to 13. In the seal at the bottom of the scroll, you will find all that you need in this world, and that includes plenty of money. Also, there are some special jutsu from your father, mother, great-grandfather and me that only you can learn since you are of our blood. Though I saw you already know one of them. Oh, just for a reference for the future, get a book on Greek mythology as well as Shinto, you will need that, trust me. Be careful my grandson. Your grandmother and great-grandfather. Yes go to your mindscape you will be having a few surprises for you. DSS. Don't forget you are under the CRA wink, wink. Naruto sighed as he looked out the window after reading the scroll. He had a lot to do in this new and strange world. Smirking, he created a shadow clone to get to work sorting out the stuff in the scroll, while he took a dive into his mindscape. It has been six months since Naruto arrived in this new land. Learning a new language had been surprisingly easy. Though he did find out that he was dyslexic in this world also, but he knew he how to deal with it. He still found it weird to be in a totally new dimension. That was not all bad, for you see, he had met a girl with the same problem. Her name was Andromeda Jackson Andy for short. She was very pretty with long wavy black hair green eyes and a good sized cup chest. The two got along very well. They were both impulsive and that hated being in school. Naruto's reason was because of his experience in the academy back home, while Andy's reason was that weird happened to her and that made not a lot of people like her. Now, Naruto being himself did not really give a rat's about that. That and the fact that he told Andy about his ninja abilities only strengthened their friendship. Andy wished that she could make shadow clones to do her own homework. However in a dark part of her mind had another reason to love shadow clones that would bring a massive nosebleed to anyone who saw it. Then through that friendship came another. Through Andy, he had meet Grover Underwood. The boy was a cripple because he was always seen with crutches. He was also a bit of a hippie in his opinion because of the fact that he barely ever ate meat and by the way he dressed. Though all in all, Grover was a very nice guy. He usually looked out for Andy and himself the best he could, of course being crippled, made him a bit weak. Now, however, our trio was on a bus to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They were taking a trip to learn about Greek mythology, not that Naruto needed it, since he knew most of it already. Sitting in his seat, Naruto saw what Andy was wearing for today. With her dark hair, she wore an orange shirt, blue jeans, and some black shoes. Grover, who was sitting right next to Andy, had his usual crutches, a yellow shirt and some oversized pants on that hid his shoes. Naruto was the odd bull of the group. Compared to his old clothes, he wore a pair of black shoes, some jeans, and a red and black shirt on that had a picture of a blue-silver Chinese dragon, roaring with a massive spout of fire erupting from his mouth. He was getting annoyed at the moment because Nancy Boba Fett was throwing wads of her peanut butter and jelly at Grover, who was acting like nothing was happening to him for their sake. Sure, if Andy did anything to stop her she would be expelled for something stupid. 
The girl was already on probation because of the odd thing that happened to her, but she couldn't help it. Naruto, however, was not and he could do anything within reason. He smirked in anticipation. I am going to kill her. Naruto heard Andy mumble. It is okay. I like peanut butter. Grover commented as he had to dodge piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it. Andy growled out as she started to get up, but Grover kept her down. That is when Andy saw the look in Naruto's eyes and smirked. You're already on probation. Grover reminded Andy. You know who'll get blamed if anything happens. Andy smirked and said, only if I am the one doing it. That statement made Grover suddenly look at Naruto, and he was about to warn his other friend in the seat next to them, but he never got the chance to because at that moment, Nancy threw another piece of her lunch at Grover. Naruto, who had been fiddling with a paper football, immediately threw the paper projectile at the wad, and it caught the piece of sandwich and kept on traveling to the window where it struck through a bit. This Boba Fett Naruto started with an annoyed smirk as he made fun of the girl's last name. Please stop that. Why the hell you care Yuzumaki? You too cool for those two losers, so why bother helping them? The redhead questioned. Because they are better people than you are. Naruto said with a glare that sent chills down the girl's spine. Now please stop her next time, the paper football will be in you and not the window. Nancy took another look at window to see part of the paper was outside and paled. She quickly nodded her head. Good girl. Naruto said making a lot of the students around them laugh, included Andy and Grover. Mr. Brunner led the museum tour. He rode up front in his wheelchair, leading the group through the big galley, past marble statues and glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. Naruto could not help but chuckle at the choice of colors. Naruto looked at Percy and saw the girl was blown away by the fact that this old stuff was in good condition. Turning their attention to Mr. Brunner, they went quiet, listened to the guy tell them about the ancient gods and other stuff like that. He had gathered them around a 13-foot old column with a big sphinx on the top, and the man started telling us how it was a grave marker, a stell, for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the sides. Naruto noticed that Andy was actually paying attention, but the idiots around them would not shut up, and when Andy told them to be quiet, for some odd reason Ms. Dodds, the annoying substitute math teacher, would give the both of them the evil eye. It was like she expected them to do something bad. That annoyed Naruto even further, and he was getting a bad vibe from her. Her chakra was odd too, he would have to keep an eye out for her. Grover noticed this as well, and we both nodded to each other. This was someone they would keep an eye out for because when Andy told them that she thought she was not human, Grover had given her a very serious look like he already knew and agreed with her. Naruto just didn't like her because she was an old bitch. Anyway, Mr. Brunner just kept on talking about Greek funeral art. When Nancy blabbed about a naked man on the stell, Naruto saw Andy snapped and practically yelled at her to shut up. Ms. Jackson. Came the voice of Mr. Brunner, did you have a comment? No sir. Andy replied, embarrassed by her outburst, which made Naruto shake his head. Sure, he was going to say the same to the redhead, but Percy beat him to it. The wheelchair man then pointed to one of the pictures on the stell, asking Andy what the picture meant. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes Mr. Brunner said, looking not that satisfied. And can you tell me why? Seeing Andy have a hard time answer that question, Naruto decided to help out. The psycho ate his kid because there was some prophecy telling him that his kids were going to take over one day like he did. Naruto explained, getting a sigh of relief from Percy he then quickly blushed at Naruto when no one was looking. He the Titan Lord went and got his panties in a twist and ate his kids because of that, but all he really did was set the prophecy in motion and screwed himself over because his wife hit her last born, Zeus, and gave the guy a rock to eat. Talk about a real rockhead. Naruto joked, which made a lot of people laugh, including Mr. Brunner. Anyway, when Zeus was all grown up he tricked his dad into barfing up his brothers and sisters and well, the war between titans and god came to be, and the gods won. Ew. One of the girls commented on the barfing part. Behind the two everyone heard Nancy Boba Fett mumble, like we're going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on our job applications, please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Ms. Jackson, Mr. Yuzumaki. Mr. Brenner said, to paraphrase Miss Boba Fett's excellent question, does this matter in real life? busted. Grover muttered shut up. Nancy barked at Grover, her face going redder than her hair. I don't know. Percy shrugged, a little relieved that Nancy was picked as well. Naruto said, maybe if we go to Greece we need to know this stuff or decide to work in a museum, otherwise I don't see it. I see. Mr. Brunner said, a bit disappointed. Well half credit to you both. Zeus did indeed feed Kronos a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other five children, who of course, being immortal gods, had been living and growing up completely undigested in the titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. 
On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Mrs. Dodds, would you lead us back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs, the guys roughhousing like normal and acting like morons. Grover, Andy, and Naruto were about to follow when Mr. Brunner said, Ms. Jackson, Mr. Uzumaki. They told Grover to keep one going while they handled whatever the teach was going to say to them. Sir. Mr. Brunner had this look, like he knew a lot more than he let on and that had seen too much. You two must learn the answer to my question. About the Titans. Andy asked. About real life. And how your studies apply to it. Oh. The two mumbled, though Naruto had the sinking feeling that the man was talking about both things. What you two learn from me, he started, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it as such. I will only accept the best from both of you, Andy Jackson, Naruto Uzumaki. This made both of the teenagers a bit angry at the man, sure he was cool in class when he set up those tournament days, but the man was pushing the two of them a bit hard. Andy mumbled something about trying harder, while Naruto just nodded his head as they left to go eat. Naruto noticed that Mr. Brunner gave a long sad look at the stell. It was odd to say the least. Heh, maybe the guy knew the girl. Dot not likely. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum, where they could watch the foot traffic along Fifth Avenue. The two noticed that storm clouds were brewing. Hey Naruto, what do you think is going on with the weather and all? Naruto gave the girl a are you serious look. You're asking me? I am not the freaking weatherman, but odd crap like this has been going on for several months now. You see it all over the news. Strange is because no one else seems to notice the clouds other than us. With that, the two teenagers joined Grover as the fountain and sat down to eat. It was away from the others so they would not be bothered, and the fact that Percy didn't like being part of the school in the first made it seem that we're not part of the school for freaks. Of course, Naruto didn't care, but he was at first pissed that he had to go to a school like this. Attention. Asked Grover. Nah, Andy answered, not from Brunner. I just wish you'd lay off me sometimes. I mean I am not a genius. After a bit, they were quiet. Then Grover asked for Andy's apple, and the girl gave it to him. Andy seemed a little odd in thought. Thinking about your mom? Naruto asked. Yeah, we are kind of close to her place. I hope she is doing alright, I mean she has been living with Gabe after all. Andy said, a little angry about her still with Gabe. Dude, I am sure she is alright. She put up with that slob this far, I am sure can do it a little bit more. Still don't see what she sees in that guy though. Naruto commented. Andy nodded and was about to unwrap her sandwich when Nancy Boba Fett and her annoying friends came over and got brave by dumping her lunch on Grover, making Naruto and Andy glare at her. Oops. She drawled out while smirking at Andy, as if daring her to do something about. That and Naruto did not have a paper football to help some. Naruto could tell that Andy was pissed and was trying to keep her temper down and was failing miserably. Then something weird happened. The water from the fountain rose up and knocked her on her ass. That is not what she saw though. Andy and Naruto pushed me. Then that old bitch, Miss Dodds came right up to them with a hard glare. Around them they heard whispers of what happened. Apparently, Naruto was not the only one to see the water move. After the old crone had made sure Nancy was alright, she turned the two and started off with that now honey crap, but Andy beat her to it. I know. Andy grumbled, a month of erasing workbooks. Naruto just sighed, this old hag was probably going to give him something worse. Though, it would seem that was not the right thing for Andy to say. Both of you come with me. Wait. Grover spoke, it was me. I pushed her. They both started a Grover for that. Andy was stunned that Grover was trying to cover for them. Naruto was put off that Grover wanted the punishment for them. The old crone didn't seem to buy it and glared at him so hard that his chin trembled. He was scared of the old crone after all. I don't think so, Mr. Underwood. But. You will stay here. Miss Dodds forcefully said each word with anger, making Grover shrink a bit. It is okay man. Andy said to her friend while Naruto nodded. With that, they left with Andy giving Nancy an evil glare while Naruto slowly took out a paper football, making the girl pale. That only made Naruto smirk. Though, when they looked back to Miss Dodds, she was already at the entrance of the museum. The two looked at each other, thinking how the hell did she get over there so fast. Naruto got a gut feeling that this was not a good thing because there were very few people in this world able to move that fast. The two walked to the end of the entrance, thinking that the old crone was going to make them buy a shirt to replace Nancy's wet one, but that seemed to not be the case because they walked right past the gift shop. Something is seriously not right here, how far into the museum does she need to take us to bitch at us? Naruto thought as they walked deeper into the museum. He looked to that Andy had the same thoughts as him. A small group made it back to the Greek and Roman gallery of the museum to find the place completely empty. They heard her growl as she looked at the marble picture of the Greek gods. You two have been making trouble for us. She said suddenly. This made the two look at her oddly. 
Percy was thinking about the candy she was selling, while Naruto was thinking about the way he has been doing his homework and selling some of it to people who did not do theirs for good cash. Well? Uh, I am not sure what you are talking about. Naruto replied. Ma'am, I don't Andy started, but the old crone didn't let her finish. Your time is up. She hissed ominously. Then the weirdness came. Her eyes began to glow like barbac coals. Her fingers stretched into talons. Her jacket melted into large, leathery wings. She was not human that was for sure. She was pretty much an old bitch with bat wings and craws and a mouth full of yellow fangs, and it seemed that she was the boy's as her next meal. Please tell me you see that too. Naruto whispered to Andy who fearfully nodded. Good, then I am not going insane. That is when things got even weirder, because Mr. Brunner, who had been reading a book at the entrance, was at the entrance of the gallery with a pen and some wrist warmers in his hands. What ho you two. The man yelled to them as he threw the items at them. That was when the old crone lunged at Andy. Naruto, thinking fast, made a seal appear on his pants, and kunai holster appeared. He then took out two of the knives and threw them at whatever Miss Dodds had turned into. Get away from my friend you psycho hag. While he old had dodged that, he then saw Andy catch the pen, but the odd thing was that it had turned to a goldish sword. Naruto then caught the wrist warmers in both hands in time to flip out of the way of Miss Dodd's claws. Andy's eyes widened when he saw her friend's new weapons. In Naruto's hands was a double-sided Najinata with one side having a standard Najinata blade with wooden swirl on its side of the handle. The other side's blade had been separated into two tips about halfway down the blade. For those who have seen Inayasha you should be able to place this weapon. Naruto rolled over to where Andy was and looked at Miss Dodds. She was getting up from her strike at Naruto, and she looked pretty intimidating. Andy looked shaken by this. Then, she charged at the two, and the only they thought of were to stab and slash her and they did. Just as their blades met, the old crone burst in a shower of yellow powder. It was like she vaporized on the spot with nothing but the smell of sulfur and a dying screech that sent chills up their spines. There was an evil chill in the air, like those creepy eyes were watching their every move. The boys were now alone in the gallery once more. They looked back to their weapons and were shocked to find something different in their possession. Andy had a an gold ballpoint pen where Naruto had two black wristband. Okay. Naruto said out loud, I think we should get back to the others. Something odd is defiantly going on here. Right. Andy agreed when she saw that Mr. Brunner was not in the room they were in. Back outside, it had started raining. Grover was using his museum map as a tent to keep himself from getting too wet, while Nancy was still wet from earlier. She looked to them and smirked. I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your butts. Boo. Andy let out. Our teacher, duh. The two blinked, asking who that was but all she did was walk away. They asked Grover where the old crone was, but he just gave them an odd look and asked who. But he did pause first before saying it, like he knew something was going on. Not funny man. Andy said, this is serious. He didn't answer as thunder boomed overhead. Shaking his head, Naruto lead Andy over to Mr. Brunner, who was under a red umbrella reading his book, like he never moved. He looked up distracted and asked, Ah. My pen, please bring your own writing utensil in the future Ms. Jackson. He said as the girl handed the item to him. Sir, Andy started, where is Miss Dodds? Who? He said with a blank face. You know, the other chaperone, the math teacher. Naruto explained. There is no Miss Dodds on this trip, nor is there one in the school. Are you two feeling alright? He asked concerned. The two just sighed and left, making their way back to Grover. On the way back, Naruto muttered out, I think we just entered the twilight zone. Andy was used to the occasional weird experience in her life, and usually they were over pretty quickly. But this 24-7 hallucination was more than she could handle. Fortunately she had her secret crush Naruto to help her out. Of course her dreams of Naruto and his clones pleasuring her by them screwing the hell out of her helped. For the rest of the school year, the entire campus seemed to be playing some kind of trick on her. The students acted as if they were completely and totally convinced that Mrs. Kerr a perky blonde woman whom she had never seen in her life until she got on the bus at the end of the field trip had been our pre-algebra teacher since Christmas. Every so often Andy would spring a Mrs. Dodds reference on somebody just to see if I could trip them up, but they would stare at me like her like she was psycho. It got so she almost believed them that Mrs. Dodds had never existed. Almost. But Grover couldn't fool her. When she mentioned the name Dodds to him, he would hesitate and then claim she didn't exist. But Andy knew he was lying. Something was going on. Something had happened at the museum. She didn't have much time to think about it during the days, but at night, visions of Mrs. Dodds with talons and leathery wings would wake me up in a cold sweat. The only thing that drove them away was thoughts and dreams of her friend and secret crush Naruto, who would hold her in his arms protectively. How that would make her moan and yearn to feel his hands all over her body which always made her hot. The freak weather continued, which didn't help her mood. 
One night, a thunderstorm blew out the windows in her dorm room. A few days later, the biggest tornado ever spotted in the Hudson Valley touched down only 50 miles from Yancey Academy. One of the current events they were studied in social studies class was the unusual number of small planes that had gone down in sudden squalls in the Atlantic that year. Andy started feeling cranky and irritable most of the time, only Naruto could make her feel better. Her grades slipped from CS to DS and FS. She got into more fights with Nancy Bobafit and her friends. She was sent out into the hallway in almost every class. Finally, when her English teacher, Mr. Nickel, asked her for the millionth time why she was too lazy to study for spelling tests, she snapped and called him an old sod. She wasn't even sure what it meant, but it sounded good. The headmaster sent her mom a letter the following week, making it official she would not be invited back next year to Yancey Academy. Fine, she told herself. Just fine. She was homesick and wanted to be with her mom in their little apartment on the Upper East Side, even if she had to go to public school and put up with her obnoxious stepfather and his stupid poker parties. And yet there were things she'd miss at Yancey. The view of the woods outside her dorm window, the Hudson River in the distance, the smell of pine trees. She'd miss Grover, who'd been a good friend, even if he was a little strange. She worried how he'd survive next year without her. She'd miss Latin class, two Mr. Brunner's crazy tournament days and his faith that I could do well. Fortunately she wouldn't have to miss Naruto who had pranked the principal and Mr. Sot deliberately to get back at them and had withdrawn his name from the school. As exam week got closer, Latin was the only test she studied for. She hadn't forgotten what Mr. Brunner had told me about the subject being life and eth for me. She wasn't sure why, but she had started to believe him. The evening before my final she got so frustrated she had thrown her copy of the Cambridge Guide to Greek Mythology across her dorm room. Words had started swimming off the page, circling her head, the letters doing 180s as if they were riding skateboards. There was no way she was going to remember the difference between Chiron and Charon, or Polydix and Polydeuces. And conjugating those Latin verbs. Forget it. She paced the room, feeling like ants were crawling around inside my shirt. I remembered Mr. Brunner's serious expression, his thousand-year-old eyes. I will accept only the best from you Andy Jackson. She took a deep breath and picked up the mythology book. I'd never asked a teacher for help before. Maybe if I talked to Mr. Brunner, he could give me some pointers. At least I could apologize for the big fat F I was about to score on his exam. I didn't want to leave Yancey Academy with him thinking I hadn't tried. I walked downstairs to the faculty offices. Most of them were dark and empty, but Mr. Brunner's door was ajar, light from his window stretching across the hallway floor. I was three steps from the door handle when I heard voices inside the office. Mr. Brunner asked a question. A voice that was definitely Grover's said. Worried about Andy and Naruto sir. I froze. I'm not usually an eavesdropper, but I dare you to try not listening if you hear your best friend talking about you to an adult. I inched closer. Alone this summer, Grover was saying. I mean, a kindly one in the school. Now that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make matters worse by rushing them, Mr. Brunner said. We need the two to mature more. But he may not have time. The summer solstice deadline will have to be resolved without them, Grover. Let them enjoy their ignorance while they still can. Sir, they saw her. Their imagination, Mr. Brunner insisted. The mist over the students and staff will be enough to convince them of that. Sir, I can't fail in my duties again. Grover's voice was choked with emotion. You know what that would mean. You haven't failed, Grover, Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now let's just worry about keeping Percy and Naruto alive until next fall. The mythology book dropped out of her hand and hit the floor with a thud. Mr. Brunner went silent. By hard hammering, I picked up the book and backed down the hall. A shadow slid across the lighted glass of Brunner's office door, the shadow of something much taller than my wheelchair-bound teacher, holding something that looked suspiciously like an archer's bow. I opened the nearest door and slipped inside. A few seconds later I heard a slow clop clop clop, like muffled wood blocks, then a sound like an animal snuffling right outside my door. A large dark shape paused in front of the glass and then moved on. A bead of sweat trickled down my neck. Somewhere in the hallway, Mr. Brunner spoke. Nothing, he murmured. My nerves haven't been right since the winter solstice. Mine neither, Grover said. But I could have sworn. Go back to the dorm, Mr. Brunner told him. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow. Don't remind me. The lights went out in Mr. Brunner's office. I waited in the dark for what seemed like forever. Finally, I slipped out into the hallway and made my way back up to the dorm. I didn't understand what I'd heard downstairs. I wanted to believe I'd imagined the whole thing. But one thing was clear. Grover and Mr. Brunner were talking about me and Naruto behind our backs. They thought we were in some kind of danger. Well she knew if anyone tried to hurt her Naruto if he didn't destroy them, she would tear them to pieces. 
The next afternoon, as me and Naruto were leaving the three-hour Latin exam, my eyes swimming with all the Greek and Roman names I'd misspelled, Mr. Brenner called me back inside. For a moment, I was worried he'd found out about my eavesdropping the night before, but that didn't seem to be the problem. Andy, he said. Don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey. It sits for the best. His tone was kind, but the words still embarrassed me. Even though he was speaking quietly, the other kids finishing the test could hear. Nancy Bobafit smirked at me and made sarcastic little kissing motions with her lips at least until Naruto gave her a death glare that shut her up immediately. I mumbled, okay, sir. I mean Mr. Brunner wheeled his chair back and forth like he wasn't sure what to say. This isn't the right place for you. It was only a matter of time. My eyes stung. Here was my favorite teacher, in front of the class, telling me I couldn't handle it. After saying he believed in me all year, now he was telling me I was destined to get kicked out. Right, I said, trembling. No, no Mr. Brunner said. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say you're not normal, Percy. That's nothing to be. Thanks, I blurted. Thanks a lot, sir, for reminding me. Andy. But I was already gone. On the last day of the term, I shoved my clothes into my suitcase. The other were joking around, talking about their vacation plans. One of them was going on a hiking trip to Switzerland. Another was cruising the Caribbean for a month. They were juvenile delinquents, like me, but they were rich juvenile delinquents. Their daddies were executives or ambassadors or celebrities. I was a nobody, from a family of nobodies. They asked me what I'd be doing this summer, and I told them I was going back to the city. What I didn't tell them was that I'd have to get a summer job walking dogs or selling magazine subscriptions and spend my free time worrying about where I'd go to school in the fall. Oh, one of the guys said. That's cool. They went back to their conversation as if I'd never existed. The only person I dreaded saying goodbye to was Grover, but as it turned out, I didn't have to. He'd booked a ticket to Manhattan on the same Greyhound as me and Naruto had, so there we were, together again, heading into the city. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. It occurred to me that he'd always acted nervous and fidgety when we left Yancey, as if he expected something bad to happen. Before, I'd always assumed he was worried about getting teased. But there was nobody to tease him on the Greyhound. Finally I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, looking for kindly ones. Grover nearly jumped out of his seat. Wow what do you mean? I confessed about eavesdropping on him and Mr. Brunner the night before the exam. Naruto definitely seemed surprised and impressed which made her feel warm inside. Grover's eye twitched. How much did you hear? Oh not much. What's the summer solstice deadline? He winced. Look, Andy I was just worried for you and Naruto, see? I mean, hallucinating about demon math teachers. Grover. And I was telling Mr. Brunner that maybe you were overstressed or something, because there was no such person as Mrs. Dodds, and... Grover, you're really, really bad liar. His ears turned pink. From his shirt pocket, he fished out a grubby business card. Just take this, okay? In case you need me this summer. The card was in fancy script, which was murder on my dyslexic eyes, but I finally made out something like... Grover Underwood. Keeper. Half-Blood Hill. Long Island, New York. 800-009-0009. What's half? Don't say it aloud. He yelped. That's my, um, summer address. My heart sank. Grover had a summer home. I'd never considered that his family might be as rich as the others at Yancey. Okay, I said glumly. So, like, if I want to come visit your mansion. He nodded. Or or if you need me. Why would I need you? It came out harsher than I meant it to. Grover blushed right down to his Adam's apple. Look, Andy, the truth is, I, I kind of have to protect you and Naruto. They stared at him. All year long, I'd gotten in fights, keeping bullies away from him. I'd lost sleep worrying that he'd get beaten up next year without me. And here he was acting like he was the one who defended me. Grover, I said, what exactly are you protecting me from? There was a huge grinding noise under our feet. Black smoke poured from the dashboard and the whole bus filled with a smell like rotten eggs. The driver cursed and steered the Greyhound over to the side of the highway. After a few minutes clanking around in the engine compartment, the driver announced that we'd all have to get off. Grover, Naruto and I filed outside with everybody else. We were on a stretch of country road no place you'd notice if you didn't break down there. On our side of the highway was nothing but maple trees and litter from passing cars. On the other side, across four lanes of asphalt shimmering with afternoon heat, was an old-fashioned fruit stand. The stuff on sale looked really good. Heaping boxes of blood-red cherries and apples, walnuts and apricots, jugs of cider and a clawfoot tub full of ice. There were no customers, just three old ladies sitting in rocking chairs in the shade of a maple tree, knitting the biggest pair of socks I'd ever seen. 
I mean these socks were the size of sweaters, but they were clearly socks. The lady on the right knitted one of them. The lady on the left knitted the other. The lady in the middle held an enormous basket of electric blue yarn. All three women looked ancient, with pale faces wrinkled like fruit leather, silver hair tied back in white bandanas, bony arms sticking out of bleached cotton dresses. The weirdest thing was, they seemed to be looking right at me, and yet looked very annoyed at Naruto for some reason. I looked over at Grover to say something about this, and saw that the blood had drained from his face. His nose was twitching. Grover. I said. Hey, man. Tell me they're not looking at you. They are, aren't they? Yeah. Weird, huh? Do you think those socks would fit me? Not funny, Andy. Not funny at all. The old lady in the middle took out a huge pair of scissors gold and silver, long-bladed, like shears. I heard Grover catch his breath. We're getting on the bus, he told me and Naruto. Come on. What? I said. It's a thousand degrees in there. Come on. He pried open the door and climbed inside, but we stayed back. Across the road, the old ladies were still watching us. The middle one cut the yarn, and I swear I could hear that snip across four lanes of traffic. Her two friends balled up the electric blue socks, leaving me wondering who they could possibly be for Sasquatch or Godzilla. At the rear of the bus, the driver wrenched a big chunk of smoking metal out of the engine compartment. The bus shuddered, and the engine roared back to life. The passengers cheered. Darn right. Yelled the driver. He slapped the bus with his hat. Everybody back on board. Once we got going, I started feeling feverish, as if I'd caught the flu. Naruto saw this, and she could tell he was worried. Grover didn't look much better. He was shivering and his teeth were chattering. Grover. Yeah? What are you not telling us? He dabbed his forehead with his shirt sleeve. Andy, what did you see back at the fruit stand? You mean the old ladies? What is it about them, man? They're not like Mrs. Dodds, are they? His expression was hard to read, but I got the feeling that the fruit stand ladies were something much, much worse than Mrs. Dodds. He said, just tell me what you saw. The middle one took out her scissors, and she cut the yarn. He closed his eyes and made a gesture with his fingers that might have been crossing himself, but it wasn't. It was something else, something almost older. He said, you saw her snip the cord. Yeah. So. But even as I said it, I knew it was a big deal. This is not happening, Grover mumbled. He started chewing at his thumb. I don't want this to be like the last time. What last time? Always sixth grade. They never get past sixth. Grover, I said, because he was really starting to scare me. What are you talking about? Let me walk you home from the bus station. Promise me. This seemed like a strange request to me, but I promised he could. Is this like a superstition or something? I asked. No answer. Grover that snipping of the yarn. Does that mean somebody is going to die? He looked at me mournfully, like he was already picking the kind of flowers I'd like best on my coffin. The rest of the journey back was silent, as soon as they got to the bus terminal they ditched Grover, because the rest of bus ride they listened to Grover. He was freaking Andy out and was looking both of them like they were basically dead men walking, except for Andy who is a girl, all the while muttering, why does this always happen? And why does it always have to be 6th grade? Whenever he got upset, Grover's bladder acted up, so they weren't surprised when, as soon as they got off the bus. Grover went to the bathroom at the bus station. Instead of waiting him, Andy got her suitcase, slipped outside with Naruto, and caught the first taxi uptown. The East 104th and 1st, Andy told the driver. You know Grover will not like this, Naruto said. I know, but we have to go. I have to get home and see my mom and Grover is freaking me out, Andy said. Alright then, Naruto said as they traveled to Andy mom's apartment, but not before he made a shadow clone to tell Grover. Along the way, Andy told Naruto all about her mom. Her name is Sally Jackson and she's the best person in the world. That also proves my theory that the best people have the rottenest luck, she said and Naruto nodded, having heard that from her a few weeks ago. Flashback. My mom's name is Sally Jackson and she's the best person in the world, which just proves my theory that the best people have the rottenest luck. Her own parents died in a plane crash when she was five and she was raised by an uncle who didn't care much about her. She wanted to be a novelist, so she spent high school working to save enough money for a college with a good creative writing program. Then her uncle got cancer, and she had to quit school her senior year to take care of him. After he died, she was left with no money, no family, and no diploma, she said before taking a pause and then beginning again. The only good break she ever got was meeting my dad. I don't have any memories of him, just this sort of warm glow, maybe the barest trace of his smile. My mom doesn't like to talk about him because it makes her sad. She has no pictures. See, they weren't married. She told me he was rich and important, and their relationship was a secret. Then one day, he set sail across the Atlantic on some important journey, and he never came back. 
Lost at sea, my mom told me. Not dead. Lost at sea. She worked odd jobs, took night classes to get her high school diploma, and raised me on her own. She never complained or got mad. Not even once. But I know I'm not an easy kid. Finally, she married Gabe Ugliano, who was nice the first 30 seconds we knew him, then showed his true colors as a world-class jerk. When I was young, I nicknamed him Smelly Gabe. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. The guy reeked like moldy garlic pizza wrapped in gym shorts. Between the two of us, we made my mom's life pretty hard. The way Smelly Gabe treated her, the way he and I got along. Flashback ends. Grover got out of the bathroom and looked around for Andy and Naruto. He only saw Naruto with his arms crossed. Naruto, where is Andy? She went home, Naruto replied, making Grover's eyes widen. What? Grover freaked. Grover, Mr. Brunner was right. I am not normal, Naruto said. You don't have to protect me, because I am perfectly capable to protect myself, and I can protect Andy. With that he disappeared in a poof of smoke. Grover had a look of pure shock on his face. A demigod duo made it to Andy's apartment and paid. Andy looked up at the apartment nervously and said, Naruto, are you sure want to come in? Smelly Gabe is a real jerk, and he will not be any different to you. Naruto smiled with a bit of annoyance. Yeah Andy. You told me about your mom and all her history, and I still can't figure why she is with this Gabe. Don't worry, I won't anger him much. I am definitely getting a bad feeling about this. Andy said as they entered the building, hoping her mom would be home from work. Instead, Smelly Gabe was in the living room, playing poker with his buddies. The television blared ESPN. Chips and beer cans were strewn all over the carpet. Wow. It is worse than I expected. Naruto thought with a deadpan expression. Hardly looking up, Gabe said around his cigar, so, you're home. Who is your loser friend? Naruto. Where's my mom? Andy replied shortly. Working, he said. You got any cash? That made Andy rolled her eyes. What no welcome back. Good to see you. How has your life been the last six months? Figures. Andy noticed that Gabe had put on weight. He looked like a tuskless walrus in thrift store clothes. He had about three hairs on his head, all combed over his bald scalp, as if that made him handsome or something. This guy managed the electronics Mega Mart in Queens, but he stayed home most of the time. It was a wonder why he hadn't been fired long before. He just kept on collecting paychecks, spending the money on cigars that made Andy nauseous, and on beer, of course. Always beer. Whenever Percy was home, he expected her to provide his gambling funds. He called that their little secret. Meaning, if she told her mom, he would punch her lights out. Of course Naruto found out about this as she had told him along the way. Naruto was not happy about that and had sworn if the asshole tried that he would be sorry he was even born. I don't have any cash, Naruto heard Andy tell him, which made the man raise a greasy eyebrow. Andy had told Naruto that the man could smell money but not much else, which was very odd. You took a taxi from the bus station, he said. Probably paid with a twenty. Got six, seven bucks and change. Somebody expects to live under this roof, he ought to carry his own weight. Am I right Eddie? Eddie, the super of the apartment building, looked at Percy with a twinge of sympathy. Come on, Gabe, he said. The kid just got here. Am I right? Gabe repeated. Eddie scowled into his bowl of pretzels. The other two guys, Naruto noticed, passed gas in harmony. Fine, Andy said. She dug a wad of dollars out of her pocket and was about to throw the money on the table. I hope you lose. Before anything could be said or done. Naruto put a hand on Andy's shoulder and the money. Andy looked at Naruto oddly before she noticed the gleam in Naruto's eye. Oh, Gabe was so screwed. First of all you have no right to demand money and say that she needs to pay to live here that is called child labor and thus illegal which I can have you put away for a long time. So how about I play? You can take my money if I lose. Naruto said. Andy smirked, she knew from experience, and a lot of others at school too, that Naruto never lost at card games and he didn't even know how to play some of them. What? A brat like you? Gabe said, eyeing Naruto a little scared when he had said the illegal part. Dot. Afraid of being beat by a kid. Naruto smirked. Besides, I got $300, are you going to pass up on that? That got Gabe's attention. Even though he was mad, Naruto did have money. He would win it from this brat and rub it in his face. Fine sit down and play. Good. Naruto sat down and leaned over to Andy. This will be over soon. You should get settled in it is your place after all. As the game began, Andy nodded and left. She hoped Gabe would so lose to Naruto. She slammed the door to her room, which really wasn't her room. During school months, it was Gabe's study. The man didn't study anything in there except old car magazines, but Gabe loved shoving Andy's stuff in the closet, leaving his muddy boots on my windowsill, and doing his best to make the place smell like his nasty cologne and cigars and stale beer. Andy dropped her suitcase on the bed. Home sweet home. 
Oh joy. As she thought about other stuff, she didn't know how much time had passed. She walked to her door in time to hear two things. Gabe's crying out, which she knew from experience that it was the cry of a loser and her mom calling him. It seemed that she was home now. I think this day just got better. She opened the door and looked at Andy with a smile on her face. Oh Andy. She hugged her tightly. I can't believe it. You've grown since Christmas. Thanks mom. Andy said. Her red white and blue sweet on America uniform smelled like the best things in the world. Chocolate, licorice, and all the other stuff she sold at the candy shop in Grand Central. She'd brought her a huge bag of free samples, the way she always did when she came home. So who is your handsome friend out there beating everyone at poker? Oh, that is Naruto Uzumaki. He is a really good friend from school. Andy replied while blushing which made her mother mentally grin at seeing her daughter had a crush on the blonde and could see why. Good to know you have a friend. Sally Jackson said softly as she hugged her again. Andy then began to tell her all about his school year at Yancey Academy. It seriously was not as bad as the headmaster said it was. She didn't really tell her much about the museum because it still freaked her out. Did something scare you? No mom. Andy lied. But whatever happened seemed to revolve around both me and Naruto. He said making her eyes widen. So, Andy found a friend like herself. That is good because if she ever got to that world, she would really need a friend and maybe something more. Mrs. Jackson thought to herself. From the other room, Gabe yelled, hey, Sally how about some bean dip, huh? Figures, even if he is beaten, he is still a jerk. Percy thought while grinding her teeth. Oh never mind. Your brat of a friend got it for us. Came Gabe's voice again. Andy gave a weak smile when she heard that. I so owe you for this Naruto. I have a surprise for you, Sally said. We're going to the beach. Andy's eyes widened. Montauk. Three night same cabin. When? She smiled. As soon as I get changed. She couldn't believe it. They hadn't been to Montauk the last two summers because Gabe said there wasn't enough money. She then looked at her hopeful and said, can Naruto come too? He can pay I am sure after the beating he gave Gabe. She laughed and nodded her head. I don't see the problem with that. But that they left her room and walked out to see a steaming Gabe and a smirking Naruto surrounded by cash, DVDs, and a set of keys. Gabe's friends were looking at Naruto like he was the poker god. Gabe looked at them and regained his compasser and said, you were in there a long time. Oh we were just talking about the trip. Sally said happily. Gabe's eyes got small. The trip. You mean you were serious about that? I knew it, Percy muttered. He won't let us go. Of course he will, his mom said evenly. Your stepfather is just worried about money. That's all. Besides, she added, Gabriel won't have to settle for bean dip. I'll make him enough seven-layer dip for the whole weekend. Guacamole. Sour cream. The works. Babe softened a bit. So this money for your trip it comes out of your clothes budget, right, because I lost most of mine to this brat. The fat man said while jutting his pudgy finger at Naruto, who had an innocent look on his face. Yes, honey, Sally said. And you won't take my car anywhere but there and back. We'll be very careful. Babe I think you are forgetting something you don't own a car anymore, it's mine now, said Naruto who grinned and Gabe started sobbing. After a few minutes Gabe scratched his double chin. Maybe if you hurry with that seven layer dip and maybe if the kid apologizes for interrupting my poker game. Maybe if I kick you in your soft spot, Andy thought and make you sing soprano for a week. She looked to her mom and it was a silent agreement that she had to be nice to Gabe if this was going to work. I'm sorry, Andy muttered. I'm really sorry I interrupted your incredibly important poker game. Please go back to it right now. Babe narrowed his eyes, trying to detect sarcasm in what Andy said. Yeah, whatever. He then Naruto just shrugged and walked over to Percy and her mom. Oh, Naruto, would you like to come with us? She asked. Uh, sure. Are you sure you want someone like me on board? Yes, you are Percy's friend after all, so you must be a good kid. Sally replied making Gabe rolled his eyes. Okay then. I hope you don't mind me paying for my stuff since I now have quite a bit of money. Naruto said pocketing his money which was about $1500. He smirked with he heard Gabe complain about having to pay for Naruto's trip. Thank you. Sally said with a smile because she heard it too. Once we get to Montauk, we'll talk more about whatever you've forgotten to tell me, okay? she said to Andy. Naruto just knew that Percy told her mom about a little of what happened. Oh Naruto, do we need to go to your place for you to pack? Before Gabe could complain, Naruto replied, nah, I got my stuff with me. Since I hung out at Andy's dorm a lot, I hardly ever went home to my apartment, which is the halfway point from here to school. Oh okay then Mrs. Jackson said, thinking that Naruto probably left his stuff somewhere near here. She then gave Andy a smile and went to make the dip for the fat ass. An hour later, they were all ready to go. 
Naruto had a backpack on now, and Sally wondered where it had come from. Andy just smiled, if only you knew mom. Hey Sally, why don't you and Andy go get in the car there is something I would like to talk to Gabe about in private. It won't take more than a minute, said Naruto. Sally Jackson looked hesitant she knew Gabe would get physical if pushed the wrong way. But Naruto gave them both a look that said he would be fine, and Andy knew it to be true. Come on mom, Naruto will be fine she said, giving her a reassuring smile before the two made their way out of the room. You got something to say to me punk Gabe asked walking right up to Naruto. Yeah this Naruto said before he punched Gabe right in the stomach, causing the man to drop to his knee and hold his stomach in agony while trying to catch his breath. You little. Be quiet Naruto said in a deadly voice. He grabbed Gabe's arm and put in behind his head while forcing his head to the ground with his other arm, causing shoots of pain to run up Gabe's arm, leaving Gabe in a kneeling position. Listen up and listen well. Sally deserves far better than you by a long shot and I don't like the way you treat her nor my friend. To be honest it's downright disgusting for any man to treat women in such a way. So from now you will start giving both of them a hell of a lot more respect and you will not insult her or Andy ever again. Also clean up this filthy apartment because it's downright disgusting at how you can make her live in such a way. If you don't I promise you there will be hell to pay. If there anything you should know about me it's that I always keep my promises. Naruto let his arm and head go and Gabe dropped to the ground in pain. The man didn't say anything, but Naruto could clearly see the scared look on his face and how pale he looked. Don't ever let me catch you treating Sally, Percy, or any other girl like that again, and if you do you will beg for death before the end, he said before he exited the room. Babe watched as Naruto and Andy put all the bags in the car. The ugly man groaned about losing his wife's cooking and then his car that he gambled with and lost which, unlike him, was kinda cool. It was a 78 Camaro. Just before they got in the car he saw Andy make that odd gesture that Grover did on the bus and whatever he did worked because as soon Smelly Gabe was in the doorway, the screen door slammed shut and probably sent the man flying. The two quickly got in the car and Andy told his mom to step on it. After a bit, Naruto could not help but laugh at what he was happened. Though, that weird gesture Andy used had energy similar to Chakra. Odd. Once they got there, Naruto smiled as he loved places like this. They set their stuff in the cabin that they got and messed around till it was dark out. They were currently sitting around a small fire, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. Mom what was my father like? Andy asked with some courage. He was kind, Andy, she said. Tall, handsome, and powerful. But gentle, too. You have his black hair, you know, and his green eyes. She fished a blue jelly bean out of her candy bag. I wish he could see you Andy. He would be so proud. Andy looked a little sad at that. Naruto thought that the kid was thinking about how her father would be proud of her with all that had ever happened. How old was I? Percy asked. I mean when he left. She watched the flames. He was only with me for one summer, Percy. Right here at this beach, this cabin. But he knew me as a baby. No, honey. He knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave before you were born. She said and then looked to Naruto, who had been silent for the conversation. Naruto, what are your parents like? Naruto chuckled a bit, but it was hollow. I am an orphan. I never really knew my parents. But I was given a video that both of my parents made just in case things went sour. I also received something that once belonged to my mother by my grandmother before she died. Apparently mom died due to complications during birth, and my father died defending me against someone who hated him. I am sorry about that. Sally said. Who is talking care of you? Don't be. My grandfather was taking care of my before he also died. Naruto said, not wanting to tell them that he was killed. But I have been doing pretty well on my own anyway. Then Andy had a sad look. She didn't know if her mom even wanted her around. She didn't think he could handle being alone like Naruto. Are you going to send me away again? Percy asked her. To another boarding school. She pulled a marshmallow from the fire. I don't know, honey. Her voice was heavy. I think I think we'll have to do something. But why do I have to go, do you not want me around? But she regretted the words as soon as they were out. Her eyes welled with tears. She took his hand, squeezed it tight. Oh, Andy, no. I I have to, honey. For your own good. I have to send you away. This made Naruto quirk an eyebrow. Okay. The way she is saying this means she knows something like Gover and Mr. Brunner. Because I'm not normal, Andy suddenly said. You say that, as if it's a bad thing Andy. But you don't realize how important you are. I thought Yancey Academy would be far enough away. I thought you'd finally be safe. Safe from what? Andy asked though when she locked eyes with her mother, all the memories of weird shit happening to her had surfaced. Before anything else was said, Naruto cut in. Andy, not being normal is not that bad. I mean look at me. I have these powers and I am fine. 
Mrs. Jackson looked at him oddly, and he sighed knowing that he would have to show her. He held out his hand and swirling ball of energy formed in his hand. Andy's eyes widened and said, you never showed that one to me. Only those shadow clones. Shadow. Could he be just like Andy, a child of the big three? Sally thought as she eyed the ball before it dissipated. She gave Naruto a grateful look and continued on. I've tried to keep you as close to me as I could, she said to Andy. They told me that was a mistake. But there's only one other option, Percy the place your father wanted to send you. And I just I just can't stand to do it. My father wanted me to go to a special school. Not a school, she said softly. A summer camp and apparently it is a place you both need to go to. Both of the teens just looked at her oddly. Naruto never heard anything about a camp in the letter he got from his grandmother and great-grandfather. I'm sorry, Andy, she said, seeing the look in her eyes. But I can't talk about it. I I couldn't send you to that place. It might mean saying goodbye to you for good. For good. But if it's only a summer camp Andy trialed off as she saw the tears in his mom's eyes. It was storming out, but both teens were sound asleep and they were having the same exact dream. It was storming on the beach and two beautiful animals, a white horse and a golden eagle, were trying to kill each other at the edge of the surf. The eagle swooped down and slashed the horse's muzzle with its huge talons. The horse reared up and kicked at the eagle's wings. As they fraught, the ground rumbled, and a monstrous voice chuckled somewhere beneath the earth, goading the animals to fight harder. Andy and Naruto ran toward them, knowing they had to stop them from killing each other, but the problem was that they were running in slow motion. They knew they would be too late. They saw the eagle dive down, its beak aimed at the horse's wide eyes. The two teens had had enough and screamed, no. Thankfully it was just a dream and they woke up with a start like it was a nightmare. Outside, it really was storming, the kind of storm that cracks trees and blows down houses. There was no horse or eagle on the beach, just lightning making false daylight and 20-foot waves pounding the dunes like artillery. This shit never happens. But the next thunderclap, Andy's mom awoke. She sat up, eyes wide, and said, hurricane. Andy knew that was crazy. Long Island never sees hurricanes this early in the summer. But the ocean seemed to have forgotten. Over the roar of the wind, he heard a distant bellow, an angry, tortured sound that made his hair stand on end. Then a much closer noise, like mallets in the sand. A desperate voice someone yelling, pounding on our cabin door. Mrs. Jackson sprang out of bed in her nightgown and threw open the lock. Grover stood framed in the doorway against a backdrop of pouring rain. But he wasn't he wasn't exactly Grover. Searching all night, he gasped. What were you two thinking? Mrs. Jackson looked at them in terror not scared of Grover, but of why he'd come. The teens were shocked at the moment to register that however. Because, instead of normal legs, Grover had legs that were like an animal's, sort of like a donkey or maybe a goat. Now Naruto had seen Kissum who looked like a humanoid shark, however he had been an enemy and knew what to look for. With Grover he looked like a satyr from the myths half-man and half-goat that somehow seemed much weirder. Andy, she said, shouting to be heard over the rain. What happened at school? What didn't you tell me? Ozu Kyaloi Theoi. Grover yelled. It's right behind me. Didn't you tell her? You mean the kindly one you blabbed about or the old crones who are the fates? Naruto shouted above the noise, making Andy's mom widen her eyes in horror. She grabbed her purse, tossed Percy and Naruto a rain jacket, and said, get to the car. All of you. Go. Grover ran for the Camaro but he wasn't running, exactly. He was trotting, shaking his shaggy hindquarters, and suddenly his story about a muscular disorder in his legs made sense. That would explain how he could run so fast and still limp when he walked. Yep we have entered the twilight zone. Naruto mumbled. But what is coming after us? He never got an answer because Grover quickly got in the car, not hearing him. He sighed and got in, going with the flow all the while fingering his wrist warmers ready to unleash them, should the need arise. The group tore through the night along dark country roads. Wind slammed against the Camaro. Rain lashed the windshield. The two honestly didn't know how Andy's mom could see anything, but she kept her foot on the gas. Naruto looked at Grover oddly, and when the lightning flashed, he saw those goat legs. He sighed, already knowing what he was and knew that Grover was on their side hopefully, and if not well one didn't need a huge IQ to know what would happen if Grover wasn't. So, you and my mom know each other? Andy asked, not able to stay silent. Grover's eyes flitted to the rear view mirror, though there were no cars behind them. Not exactly, he said. I mean, we've never met in person. But she knew I was watching you. Watching me? Keeping tabs on you? Making sure you were okay. But I wasn't faking being your friend, he added hastily. I am your friend. Um what are you, exactly? Andy asked. That doesn't matter right now. It doesn't matter. From the waist down, my best friend is a donkey. Grover let out a sharp throaty blah ha ha. Naruto could tell that Grover a bit ticked, but he gaffed, that was really funny to him. Goat. 
Grover cried. What? Once getting himself under control, Naruto helped the poor guy out. Andy, he is a sadder. A being that is half human and half goat. Huh? But. You would mean Mr. Brunner's myths. You paid attention to that. Naruto smirked. Let's throw a party. Andy just glared at him, though the effect was ruined by her blush. Okay okay. Anyway, with the way Grover reacted, I am assuming that other Satter would trample you for that donkey remark. I thought it didn't matter. Andy shot back while Grover bleated again. Obviously it does. Naruto replied with a smirk. Wait, so all that Mr. Brunner taught us was actually preparing us for this stuff? Pretty much. Grover said. Great Naruto replied sarcastically. Just what we need. Freaky monsters coming after us. Not only that, but those three old ladies were the fates and not myths, and neither was Mrs. Dodds. Grover told them. So you admit there was a Mrs. Dodds? Andy exclaimed. Of course. Okay, so what was the point of hiding the fact that she was real? Naruto asked. The less you knew, the fewer monsters you'd attract, Grover said, like that should be perfectly obvious. We put mist over the human's eyes. We hoped you'd think the kindly one was a hallucination. But it was no good. You both started to realize who you are. Do I wait a minute, what do you mean? Andy asked. You really need to learn to explain things clearly Grover. Naruto deadpanned. A weird bellowing noise rose up again somewhere behind us, closer than before. Whatever was chasing us was still on our trail, and it seemed to have friends a lot of friends. Andy, his mom said, there's too much to explain and not enough time. We have to get you two to safety. Safety from what? Who's after us? Andy asked while Naruto raised an eyebrow. Oh, nobody much, Grover said, obviously still miffed about the donkey comment. Just the Lord of the Dead and it seems a lot of his bloodthirstiest minions. Grover. Sorry Mrs. Jackson. Could you drive faster, please? Grover replied. What, you mean Hades? Naruto replied and the ground shook a bit and Grover nodded a little panicked. While the two were trying to wrap their heads around all this madness, Andy's mom made a hard left. They swerved onto a narrower road, racing past darkened farmhouses and wooded hills, and pick your own strawberry signs on white picket fences. Where are we going? Andy asked. The summer camp I told you about. His mother's voice was tight, she was trying for Andy's sake not to be scared. The place your father wanted to send you. The place you didn't want me to go. Please, dear, his mother begged. This is hard enough. Try to understand. You're in danger. Because some old ladies cut yarn? Andy asked and Naruto sighed. If you paid attention in class you would know why that is bad. Naruto said. When they cut the yarn that means someone is going to die. Exactly. Grover said, the fact they appeared in front of you too, they only do that when you're about to when someone's about to die. Whoa you said you. Andy freaked. No, I didn't. I said someone. Grover replied. Grover that is still not very helpful. Naruto said. Yeah, you meant me. Andy said. I meant you, like someone. Not you, you. God, I hope it is not me or you. Naruto replied. Children. Andy's mom said. She pulled the wheel hard to the right, and they got a glimpse of a figure she'd swerved to avoid a dark fluttering shape now lost behind us in the storm. The hell was that? Naruto muttered. We're almost there, Mrs. Jackson said, ignoring Naruto's question. Another mile. Please. 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 They didn't know what there was, but it had to be safe from whatever the hell was chasing them. Suddenly there was a blinding flash, a jaw-rattling boom, and the car exploded. It was an odd feeling being blown up, like you were, weightless, crushed, burned, and being hosed down all at the same time. Andy pried her forehand off the driver's seat in front of her as her mom called out to her. Ugh I am fine, she heard Naruto mutter out a super as they noticed the car was still intact because it was in a ditch. They sighed in relief that they were not dead. Not yet anyway. While Naruto was trying to regain his bearings, Andy noticed that Grover looked unconscious. Grover. Food he groaned. Naruto sweat dropped at that, yeah, he was going to be fine. Andy, his mother said, we have to her voice faltered, because when the lightning flashed, they saw several huge figures through the mud-splashed window. Hello. Naruto said surprised. Boys, Andy's mother said, deadly serious. Get out of the car. She tried the driver's said, but all the mud was blocking their way out. Passenger sighed. Get out now and run to the big tree. She yelled pointing to a large tree in the distance as they got out. What? Andy replied, confused until the lightning flashed and a large pine tree in the distance appeared, and that thing was huge. That's the property line, his mom said. Get over that hill and you'll see a big farmhouse down in the valley. Run and don't look back. Yell for help. Don't stop until you reach the door. Mom, you're coming too. Her face was pale, her eyes as sad as when she looked at the ocean. No. Andy shouted. You are coming with us. Help me carry Grover. Dude. 
Grover moaned, a little louder. Then suddenly there were several loud roars, and the three turned to see and beheld quite a sight. Monsters were everywhere, numbering in the hundreds. Naruto felt really furious at the sight for he knew that they were here. They smelled him and Andy and they wanted to kill him and his future mate. He would not let this happen, and thus he knew what to do. Andy, Naruto yelled to get her attention. Take your mother and Grover and hightail it to the camp, I'll take care of these pieces of garbage and join you later. No. Naruto turned to see Grover had reawakened. Naruto you can't do that, Thalia a daughter of Zeus, tried to take on an army not even this big and lost. You will die if you try this. Grover listen to me, unlike Thalia I am used to overwhelming odds, and I have turned out fine. This army ha, hey, I have beaten larger and stronger forces, so don't worry and just go and get those two out of here. Grover didn't have a chance to talk back because at that moment the monsters started to roar and prepare for the attack. Naruto channeled chakra to his wrist warmers, and the weapon that appeared in Naruto's hands wasn't the weapon that Naruto received from Brunner, but a different weapon more legendary than the Kusanagi. It was an Ajinata or to be more accurate the weapon was called the Aim no Nuhoko or the Heavenly Jeweled Spear. According to Japanese mythology, the gods Izanagi and Izanami were responsible for creating the first land. To help them do this, they were given an Ajinata decorated with jewels. The two deities then went to the bridge between heaven and earth and churned the sea below with an Ajinata. When drops of salty water fell from the tip, they formed into the first island. Izanagi and Izanami then descended from the bridge of heaven and made their home on the island. Naruto then shouted sword mode, and the Najinata then changed to a jeweled katana with a blood-red blade. This was the weapon he had found in the scroll that was given to him when he had first come to this world. Apparently this weapon had helped his mother gain the title of Red Death that combined with her red hair, and this blade made her a very fearsome opponent that few dared cross. At the sight of the blade the monsters charged to battle their prey. Naruto responded in kind and unleashed the first attack and sent a blade of wind at the monsters, cutting in half at least ten monsters. It just caused them to go faster in their charge which Naruto responded in kind. He jumped into the middle of the monsters and started slashing quickly destroying several monsters and then closed his eyes. The army started to close in on Naruto from all sides. He just smirked and opened his eyes to show that they had changed as he shouted Shinra Tensei. This caused the monsters to blow backwards. As they were in the air and falling Naruto disappeared in a flash of yellow. Suddenly the monsters were yelling in pain as they disappeared into dust. There were now only roughly 40 monsters left when Naruto reappeared. The rest of the monsters were really nervous and just decided to run for it. Naruto smirked and turned to go to the camp when he saw a sight that chilled his blood. He saw Grover knocked out, Sally nowhere in sight with Andy holding for dear life on the back of the Minotaur. Apparently Naruto's jutsu had sent the beast out far and had decided to attack the other demigod. He rushed to help when he saw Andy pull on a horn and break it off while tumbling off the top of the Minotaur. Just as Andy was getting up after her tumble the beast had turned around and was about to grab the girl when Naruto jumped in, sliced off the other horn and kicked the monster away. Naruto then did a few hand signs and shouted Earth style. Earth swamp and the Minotaur had sunk into the ground up to its waist and its arms had become stuck in the mud. Andy saw Naruto give her a look and she knew what to do. She got up and ran over to the monster and rammed the horn into the monster who yelled in pain as it disappeared. She then collapsed. Naruto walked over to her and picked up Andy to get her walking while they supported each other until they got to Grover. Come on, we gotta get to that house, we won't be out of the woods until we do. Naruto said as he threw Grover over his shoulder while the two demigods supported each other as the rain has suddenly stopped. When they got to the pouch, Naruto fell to his knees and it seemed that Andy was barely conscious. The weight of the two and the battle was just now getting to him. Ugh. I am weak. I have not fought in a long time to be this tired from a little fight. Looking up, he saw the familiar face of Mr. Brunner, who was giving them a serious look. The also a very pretty blonde-haired girl, whose hair looked curled like a princess's. One of them has to be it. They just have to. The girl said. Silence, Annabeth, Mr. Brunner said. They're still conscious. Bring them inside. Yes, they would be very helpful if you don't mind. Naruto replied weakly, catching them off guard. Going inside, Naruto helped the girl named Annabeth put Andy and Grover on different cots in the room. Um my name is Annabeth Chase by the way. The girl said with a small smile and blush. Naruto cracked his back and said with a weak smile, Naruto Uzumaki, and if you don't mind, I am about to lose consciousness. Annabeth had wide eyes as she watched him put his back to the cot and say, good night. Before falling down, out like a light. Still never ceases to amaze me. Mr. Brenner suddenly said, making the girl jump. Which one? All three. They protected each other in that school I went to. Naruto seems to be a natural fighter though. He replied. But considering where he from, I am not surprised. Where? 
Oh, I am sure he will tell you and the rest of the camp later. Come and get me when one of them wakes. Mr. Brunner said as he left. Now Annabeth was even more curious. Naruto woke up with a start as he bolted up in the bed he was in. That scared the crap out of Annabeth, who had just walked in. Ah. Don't do that. Ha, eh, sorry. Naruto said while scratching the back of his head. He looked at the horn he was still holding and then to Andy, who was still out of it. He brought a hand up to his chin and said, so all of that crap did happen. Yep, sighed Annabeth. I still can't believe you two were able to kill all of those monsters. Naruto smirked and said, believe it. Anyway, knowing that names have power around here, I will just call the last one the bull freak on steroids. Annabeth stared at Naruto for a long time, making him a bit uncomfortable, until she let out a laugh, which was followed by another laugh from Mr. Brunner. Good to see you again old man. Naruto commented. Before Annabeth could correct him, Mr. Brunner chuckled and said, Naruto, here I am called Chiron. The look on Naruto was priceless. He was still smiling, but he had the oh shit smile, but then smirked. Oh, so where is your horse half? I always thought you were real horses ass a few times which turns out quite literally to be the truth. Annabeth had to cover her mouth so she could cover a snort. This is a magical wheelchair to when I want to go out, I use this to hide my true self. The now dubbed Chiron replied. Oh, that makes sense. So, how long was I out? You just got here last night. That is why I said you shouldn't even be up. Annabeth said. Oh well, I have always been a really fast healer. I thought it was because of the fox, but he trailed off as he saw Annabeth gave him a look of confusion, while Chiron had a serious look on his face. I take it you have no clue what I am talking about. No. The blonde girl said. I have an idea. Fox is known as the QB, correct? Chiron asked. Yeah, how do you know about that in this world? Naruto asked with narrowed eyes while Annabeth looked even more confused. I hear things when I got to the annual meets of the gods. Some speak about going to a world that the humans wielded great power and of a great beast called the Jaiubi that was split into several entities. They were known as the Tailed Beasts, and the Kyubi was the strongest of them all. Chiron explained. They even spoke of people who were forced at birth to hold these beasts in their bodies via seal, and you were one of them. Yeah. So what of it Naruto asked. Only a demigod can handle the power of the Kyubi within their body, but not any old demigod, no a child of the big three. Or one's descendants. You are in the same boat as Andy. If you are indeed a child of the big three, then one of you has to decide the fate of the world at a later time as said in a prophecy of the oracle. Naruto held up a hand for him to stop. I am not interested nor do I want to decide the fate of the world. If what you say is true then, I will leave it to Percy, she is a good kid, I am sure she will do the right thing. As for me deciding that, well, as an old friend says, it is way too troublesome. I see, just know that the prophecy says the time will come when the demigod is 16, so we have time. Chiron replied. Naruto's eyes widened and he inwardly groaned before saying, well, nothing is set in stone. He then tried to get up but felt kind of weak. Great. One major fight and I am out. I need to get back in shape. He then thought back to what Chiron said. Hey, if I am a kid of the big three, whose am I? We have no idea, but we must keep watch until they claim you. Besides, being one of the big three's kids is kind of bad. Chiron stated. Why? Because, they swore an oath after World War II that they would not have kids anymore. Annabeth answered for him. Naruto snorted. Well, we can see how that worked out. Yes, Chiron smirked. Annabeth, would you please get some ambrosia and nectar? It should help him recover faster. As she left, he noticed Naruto looking at him oddly. It is the food of the gods. Normal human can't eat it or they will die. Demigods eat it because if helps the recover and it is good for them. Ah. Naruto's smart reply was. Then Annabeth came in with a bowl of some golden liquid. Shrugging as it was better than nothing he took and bide and tasted an all too familiar taste. Could it be, was he right about it after all? Aye it. It tastes just like Ichiraku's ramen. He yelled out with a nime tears, making Annabeth take a step back at his suddenly loud voice that didn't even wake up Percy. He only did this because he hasn't had their ramen in a long time. Tyron just chuckled nervously. So how do you feel? Chiron asked. Like I could fight another monster army and come out on top but not get so tired. Naruto said as he got up. He noticed he still had his kunai pouch on and put the horn in it and seal it all back up, making Annabeth's eyes go wide. What the? She let out. Naruto looked at her oddly before saying, seals. Very useful. Indeed. Chiron commented with a smirk. Now I will have a camper show you the cabin for later. Then you come back here. When Andy wakes up I will tell more about this as I don't want to say this twice. Fair enough. Naruto as he follow him out the door. Annabeth, please continue to watch Andy please. 
Chiron ordered while the girl nodded, still wondering about those seals. Once outside, Naruto raised an eyebrow. This place was pretty big. He looked around to see that the hill with the pine tree was not far from them. He felt odd looking at it, like he was being pulled towards it. He shook the feeling off for the moment and looked ahead to see a bunch of cabins in a U-shaped arc. Tyron, not noticing Naruto's small distraction, called out to it he saw a girl walking by Claris. Come here please. The girl turned her head and saw Chiron and one of the new guys everyone was talking about. She smirked and walked over. Naruto noticed that she was pretty tall, strong looking, and probably a year or two older than him. She was not ugly but more of a tough beauty, she looked gruff and had the look of a fighter. What? Came her response when she arrived. I would like for you to show Naruto here around the cabins for the moment. I will probably have Annabeth show Naruto and Percy around camp later when the latter wakes up. Chiron stated. Fine, gotta welcome the newbie anyway. She said with an evil smirk. Naruto raised an eyebrow as that. He knew that smirk, he used it when he did a prank. He guessed that she was welcoming committee. Well come on brat. She called out, already walking away. He followed her all the way to the middle of the arc of cabins. Okay, listen closely cause I am only going to say this once. There are 12 cabins in all. Each one represents the Greek good it was made for. Their kids are the one who live in there. Since you and the runt are new and have not been claimed yet, you two will go to cabin 11, the Hermes cabin. Naruto nodded, Hermes did shelter a lot of people, so it made sense. And the one you are in? He asked nonchalantly. The God of War's cabin. She proclaimed while well point to a red cabin. Cool. Naruto replied. Right, now we have the other cabins. We got Demeter, Dionysus, Athena, Apollo, Aphrodite, Hephaestus, Hera, Zeus, Artemis and Poseidon. She said pointing to each. He looked at Zeus and Hera's and quirked an eyebrow. They got some pretty fancy cabins for nobody to use. He noticed that a Hades cabin was not there odd since he was part of the big three. He also noticed a big space between Poseidon and Zeus's cabins. Maybe they planned on making one and forgot since they never got any kids from Hades. Now. It is not to officially welcome you. Claris called out, making a lot of people look toward them and they grimaced. Claris was breaking in another newbie. Even though Naruto helped in killing that army, they felt sorry for him. She quickly reacted out and tried to grab him by the collar. Keyword here is tried. She along with everyone else gasped as she grabbed the log of wood, stumbled, fell to one knee. What the hell? She screamed in her head. Before she could get up, she felt cold metal against her neck. She glanced to the right to see Naruto was facing the other way she was and looked at her from his side and with a smirk on his face, similar to her evil one earlier. For someone born from war. You have slow reflexes. Naruto said releasing a small bit of killer intent while still smirking. They heard a lot of people asking others how he did that, and to Claris of all people. Some noticed that he had his kunai pouch on, and that he didn't have that before. Deciding to scare them, he withdrew his kunai from her neck, put it in his pouch, sealed it away, earning a few gasps of shock as it just disappeared. He shocked them even more as he stepped back and offered a hand to help Claris up. The while that was happening Claris was in deep shock. The hell, I have never been bested like that. She then noticed the hand and quickly took it. She nodded her head and they walked back to the big house where Naruto came out of. Along the way, she was thinking deeply. He could be an Ares kid if he is not I am not sure what else he could be. He beat me and could have killed me with me knowing it. What is this odd ass feeling? Arriving at the big house, Chiron saw that Naruto looked bored and Clissire looked a little lost. He had a feeling something went wrong with her welcome plan and wait, could see that she was developing a crush for the blonde. Gods I feel so sorry for him. At any rate, he was probably going to be hearing what happened from the other campers. Back already I see. Be started, since Percy won't be fully awake until tomorrow, I would like for you to stay near here. Alright then. I am going to take a nap next to the big pine tree. Say a later Chiron, Claris. And before Chiron could say anything, Naruto had ninja jumped up to the tree. Neither noticed that Claris had quickly walked away with a small pink tint to her cheeks. Naruto arrived at the tree and sat down with his back to it. This tree had been pulling at him the whole time. He idly wondered if it was cursed or something like that. Slowly falling asleep, he laid his head against the tree and was out. Whenever he slept, he had dreams, but this was the most vivid dream he had ever had. He was in a large white room and he was not alone. A girl stood across from him, staring at him with shocked eyes. She has shoulder-length spiky black hair and blue eyes, with freckles under her eyes, mostly on the left, and she is wearing some punk-style clothes. To him she looked beautiful. Um. Hey. My name is Naruto Yuzuamki. Who are you and where are we as I know this can't be a dream? The girl gulped and said, Thalia and we are in limbo. The oh so here is the current harem. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series.
Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.